It's indeed a pleasure to see you all here. Uh, you know, this is our stakeholder forum, and it's indeed a pleasure to see our main stakeholders here. I'm mentioning representative of the industry, and I'm very pleased to see that we have with us indeed several industry scientists, as well as uh, the um, individuals who are responsible for IMI at FPR. We have with us the director of the science policy at FPR, who is taking care of IMI, uh, Magda Schlebus. And we have also other uh, FPI representatives, for example, from the industry liaison group, who is also in charge of IMI. And I think that one of the uh, ideas of this stakeholders forum is indeed to take this opportunity uh, indeed to discuss with industry. I will come back to the main mission of IMI in a moment, but it's clear that industry is at the forefront. I'm also very pleased to see that we have uh, several uh, members of our uh, scientific committee with us. I saw our Vice Chair Dan Cromlin and also uh, Francoise Meunier, who was recently appointed on board of our scientific committee. This committee has a very important role to advise the governing board about the IMI activities, the topics that are proposed by industry uh, also. Um, and I know that there, is, there are also in the audience many uh, people interested to uh, join IMI, who are part of IMI uh, consortia, either uh, dealing with projects related to research and development, and we should not forget that IMI is also taking care of education and training, and I think that I saw in the assistant Hans Linden, who is playing a very important role in promoting education and training activities uh, within IMI. So welcome to uh, all of you, and uh, I will make a short introduction to set the stage. I guess that most of you are familiar with the overall mission of IMI, but still, I think that before we enter into more uh, concrete information, that it's uh, probably um, wise to remind you and us that we are all there with a common objective, which indeed to promote the development of uh, new drugs, better drugs, safer drugs, and that we also know that in order to provide access to patients in Europe, but I would say worldwide, to these new medicines, we must produce them at an acceptable cost, and uh, certainly this... Um, the, this notion of cost-benefit is uh, very important, as well as the notion of uh, benefit-risk. Uh, and as you know, we uh, badly need these novel pharmaceuticals for a number of diseases, including diseases which are very high on the agenda of IMI, for example, neurodegenerative disorders, diabetes, and antimicrobial resistance, which will be a very important topic today. So uh, you also know that so far uh, IMI is the largest public-private partnership in the sector in terms of budget. You, uh, also, you already know that the pharma companies contribute to 1 billion euro in the form of in-kind contribution, which by and large mean human resources, which by and large mean industry scientists which uh, are on board of our projects. And uh, you also know that the partners of the companies uh, receive public funding from the European Union. They can be academia, they can be SMEs, they can be patients' organization or regulatory bodies. I think that it's also uh, important to remind the initial objectives how they were uh, identified in 2007, and they are still valid today. It's really to overcome bottlenecks in drug development by fostering collaboration and uh, obviously to increase investment in the biopharmaceutical sector at large and to contribute to the health of citizens, not only in Europe, by the way, but uh, worldwide. So which are the key bottlenecks in pharmaceutical research and development? And we could spend uh, hours discussing this, but let me emphasize a few of those because they will be relevant to our discussion today. Disease heterogeneities. 
the disease heterogeneity. We know from cancer that you, when you say this woman is suffering from a breast cancer, you didn't say enough to indeed identify the best therapy for uh, this person. We have indeed to stratify cancer patients, but this is also true for other diseases. I'm thinking about inflammatory disease, about brain disorders, where uh, very often we are dealing much more with syndromes, uh, with a spectrum of disorders, than with a single disease entity. And probably autism is one of those examples. As you know, we also lack um, reliable biomarkers to assess drug efficacy safety early enough during drug development, and this is a major problem for industry, but also for regulators. We are lacking efficient pharmacovigilance tools, and recent examples, for example, in France with Mediator, clearly illustrates this. Our clinical designs are not well adapted to each situation. The classical placebo control trials uh, are not uh, the best uh, design for a number of situations. And finally, and I insist on this because that's at the core of IMI, a bottleneck might be the lack of sufficient incentive for industry. And we have to consider that indeed industry has to take into consideration the public needs, but as you all know, that's the real situation. Industry has also to take into consideration some financial aspects, some business aspects, when it comes to uh, production of uh, new medicines. And if you don't have enough incentive for industry, industry, also they might have in their freezers very promising products, might just decide not develop them further just because of this lack of incentive. I will come back to that later. Uh, so it's on this basis that uh, the uh, European Union and the European Federation of Pharma Association decide to establish this partnership to launch uh, research and uh, development project, education and training project, based on uh, three important concepts. First, collaboration between FPR companies, between those large pharma, which normally are competitors, strong competitors on the market, but which identify a clear interest for them to collaborate, to mutualize resources during very specific steps of drug development. Not only they realize the interest to collaborate together, but also they identify the need to find the best partners possible outside industry. And this is what we are doing at the executive office, is to select the best partners possible in academia, in SMEs, etc., for the FPI companies committed to a given topic. Finally, the consortia gathering all these partners work in a spirit of open collaboration, which means data sharing as much as possible, which means dissemination of results as rapidly as possible in the broad scientific community. Now, since these concepts were established, uh, as I said, some five years ago, things have evolved for a number of reasons. I have no time to elaborate on this, but the consequences are that the so-called pre-competitive space, the boundaries of this space have changed. We are now extending the pre-competitive space. This is the case, for example, of the uh, H2POCM uh, consortium uh, in uh, Canada, and they clearly identify the need to, uh, for example, uh, consider a proof of concept uh, mechanism clinical trials within the pre-competitive space. Uh, as you will see, IMI is extending now this space further by funding pivotal trials to accelerate uh, drug uh, commercialization, and finally, access to patients. And that's why we don't like so much to use the word pre-competitive. We prefer to talk about collaboration or non-competitive space. 